event. Come on. So I want to start my sermon today. We've already had some fun, but I want to start with a bit more fun um, by taking a survey about a very contentious and divisive topic in our culture. There are two groups of people in this room, as well as in the live stream. And this has to do with when is the appropriate time to start playing Christmas music? <laughs> come on, come on, hold on. Now, it was, it'll be very interesting to see how things shake out with the second service. Things were weighted heavily in one direction for the first service, but let's see. So I want everyone to participate with a show of hands and maybe some enthusiasm beyond the hand. Uh, the first group, the first group, you already have 100.3 FM, Detroit's Christmas Station, locked in on your radio. You've already been playing Christmas music, even though it's November 7th. You've already been playing on the radio, or you plan to real soon. Um, and the reason is you love, you love Christmas music, it's the best music, and you feel like if you play it earlier in the season, it just helps to stretch out the season that goes by, by way too fast. How many of that's you? Hands up, cheer, come on, how many? How many? All right, all right. Group number two, group number two, you, thou shalt not turn on 100.3 until after Thanksgiving, one holiday at a time for you. Um, so you might play Christmas music maybe the week of Thanksgiving, but definitely not this early. And maybe you're even offended at the fact that they're playing it so early. How many of that's you? Well, that's you. All right. You need to know there is room at the mission for both groups. There really is. But, 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 so you know, so you know, the girls... My girls, on Friday morning, every morning this week, they've been tuning 100.3, and Friday morning, they knew we flipped to Christmas music, and I heard on World School, we have jam boxes still, Rudy the Red-Nosed Reindeer by Dean Martin playing. <laughs> First Christmas song, which we'll hear probably another 800 times between now and Christmas, but that's where my kids land. But grace abounds, grace abounds wherever you're at. Um, so this weekend is daylight saving time. We're all, again, more chipper than we normally are, extra refreshed. I love the extra hour of sleep. Um, and by the way, and so we don't need coffee this morning, but good news is we're about to have coffee at the Mission. The cafe is reopening. Come on, two weeks from now, November 21st. This, it's been closed down since COVID began, thanks to Sue and Mike and the whole team who are helping lead the cafe, all the volunteers. And so again, November 21st, we're going to have coffee and other fun things. If you are a volunteer, please stop by the cafe table in the lobby to grab your instructions on just how, how, how to follow everything. So thanks again to everybody who's volunteering to step up. It's been a long time coming, and we're going to be super excited. It's going to be some extra energy in the room um, coming up. We offer coffee in our hand in a couple of weeks. So, but, but that's in the future. Again, come to Thankful Fest, and then we'll have our cafe next week, but we're in week six of our series, Giant Slayers. And this series is about the most well-known story, arguably, in all of Scripture, David versus Goliath. And even if you weren't born and raised in the church, it's part of our culture. Pretty much everyone has heard of it, the ultimate underdog story. We're familiar with it. But our familiarity with it has blinded us to what it really teaches, to how it should impact our spiritual journeys and so we're going to, in this series, just take this again a few verses at a time. And after six weeks of this series, we're finally going to talk about the battle itself this week and next week. Even though the battle takes place in about five seconds, we're going to take two Sundays to unpack it. And so we're finally there. Today's sermon is called, You Do You. And that is a phrase that if you have young children, you have heard it come out of your children's mouths. One of my girls, I don't even know when, a few months ago, they said to someone, you do you. And I was like, what? who do what? You did? Who? And they said, dad, I said, you do you. I actually, no joke, I Googled it. What does, <laughs> hey Google, what does you do you mean? I'm 48 years old, so my days of being on the cutting edge of being cool are in the rearview mirror, if they ever were there in the first place, to be honest. That's, you know what, yeah, God makes us all unique, and that's good. Um, so, um, what it means, in case you're wondering, you do you, is basically telling someone, hey, do what you think is best, do what suits your personality, and as I thought about David fighting Goliath, it's the perfect sermon title, you do you, because of how David 
chose to fight Goliath. And so I want to start today actually at the end of the battle, and then I'm going to circle back to the moments that lead up to it. And I want to do that for for reasons of just how I felt the Holy Spirit lead me of where I want to land today. I need to point out the end of the battle to frame the key point that I want to get to. And plus I know if I share the end of the battle first, it's not like I'm going to be like, Uh, doing a spoiler alert on anybody, like, wait, you're saying David beat Goliath, you know? No spoiler warning needed because we all know what happened. So I'm going to start at the end of the battle, and then I'm going to go up to the moments leading up to it. So here's the climax of the fight, a fight that was over just moments after it started, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. David picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his bag, his shepherd's bag. Then armed with only his, his staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistines. Skipping down to verse 49. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into the shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath tumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran out and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Beautiful word picture there. Now, here's what's interesting about this passage and about this battle that was over like a few seconds after it began. Just like how the Bible says that Goliath was over nine feet tall, This is another part of the story where skeptics look at the details of what took place in the battle and they say, couldn't happen that way. Has to be a fairy tale. Someone made it up. David could not have actually defeated Goliath that way and there's no way the stone could lodge into someone's forehead. So again, a skeptic would say this is just evidence that the Bible is a bunch of fairy tales. And that's actually what I used to believe. I was an atheist. I was born and raised Catholic, bailed hard on God and hard on the faith during my college years going to Oakland University, studying engineering, and I used to think that, yeah, the Bible's made up of fairy tales. And even if, by the way, even if you're a believer and follower of Jesus today, you might honestly wonder about those details, and you might have some doubts, if you're honest, where you say, you know what, I believe the Bible is God's word, it is inspired, it is, it is the sacred text, and so, so you know it's true, because it's God's word, but then Sometimes like, well, do you actually believe it's true though? Which is different. (laughs) And maybe there's some doubts where you wonder if maybe the skeptics are right. Maybe, you know, the Holy Spirit inspired the author and they kind of embellish the details a little bit. And so wherever you're at on your spiritual journey today, if you're a skeptic today or if you are a follower and believer of Jesus, I want to share a quote with you. It's actually an extended quote that will show that you do not need to check your brain at the door to believe this story. The quote I'm going to share shows that you don't need to have blind faith to believe the story because, by the way, blind faith is not biblical faith. Part of the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all of your mind, right? Love God with our minds. So here's a quote from a guy, Malcolm Gladwell. Super smart guy, does a ton of research, does his homework. I've read every one of his books. And you can trust what this guy says. Here's what he says. Ancient armies had three kinds of warriors. The first was cavalry, armed men on horsebacks or in chariots. The second was infantry, foot soldiers wearing armor and carrying swords and shields. The third were projectile warriors, or what today would be called artillery, archers, and most important, slingers. Slingers had a pouch made of, made of leather attached on two sides by a long strap of rope. They would put a rock or a lead ball into the pouch, swing it around in increasingly wider and faster circles, and then release one end of the rope, hurling the rock forward. Slinging took an extraordinary amount of skill and practice. But in experienced hands, the sling was a devastating weapon. An experienced slinger could kill or seriously injure a target at a distance of up to 200 yards. Eitan Hirsch, a ballistics expert with the Israeli Defense Forces, recently did a series of calculations showing 
that a typical size stone hurled by an expert slinger at a distance of 35 meters would have hit Goliath's head with a velocity of 34 meters per second or 76 miles per hour for us Americans. More than enough to penetrate his skull and render him unconscious or dead. The Romans even had a special set of tongs made just to remove stones that had been embedded in some poor soldier's body by a sling. That's amazing stuff to me. Again, engineering background, got to share that stuff. But I'm, I'm amazed, again, say from here to the corner of tw 24 Mile in Shelby, like 200 yards, someone's like that accurate. It's like the sharpshooters of the day like snipers of the day, were slingers. And a stone, right, traveling 76 miles an hour is, does, is more than enough to do major damage, if not kill on impact. And in fact, again, the Roman army created a special tool, which is fascinating to think about, that, that stones were embedded in soldiers' bodies, had to have a special tool to remove them. So, by the way, a special thanks to some folks from the church. They showed up yesterday and said, hey, we have a gift for you. And the gift is this. Five smooth stones and a sling. And so I'm going to demonstrate that. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I really want to, though. I actually practiced, like, swinging this. And, you know, then it's like, okay, what would your insurance company say, you know, if you, like, <laughs> took someone out, you know? Like, hey, Andrew, here we go. Ready? Woo! You know? Um, <laughs> so... That's what would happen. <laughs> so I'm going to fight the urge to sling that stone. But again, just imagine, again, the damage that could be done if one of these things came at you at 76 miles an hour. Just imagine that. And I love the visual, again, of having the sling and these stones, as well as reading that quote from the expert in ballistics, because it, it builds my faith that we can believe that David defeated Goliath the way the Bible says that he did without checking your brain at the door. And so that's the climax of the story, how David defeated Goliath with a stone and a sling. That was his weapon of choice. And so with that in mind, and I want to go back to a few verses that led up to the moments which led David to choose that as his weapon. Because there's some key details in the passage, again, we can read right past and we can miss that are significant for our spiritual journey and how to live the life God calls us to live. And so we'll go back a handful to the 37th verse, a few verses, to the moments leading up to the battle. Here is what it says. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Now, if you were here last Sunday and you heard me preach that message, those words of Saul should actually be pretty shocking to you. Because last week I shared how, how David offered to fight Goliath, and at first everyone mocked him, including King Saul. At first, everyone assumed the worst about David. Here's a reminder of a verse I shared last Sunday of what King Saul said in verse 33. Don't be ridiculous, he said this to David. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. So that's what Saul says to David in verse 33. And then a few verses later, Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. May the Lord be with you. And so a lot happens in four verses where Saul dramatically changes his mind. And what I find equally fascinating and frustrating is the Bible doesn't explain why. Like where Saul goes from telling David, don't be ridiculous, to give it your best shot, my man. It's a profound change of mind, especially if you read the passage, like the fate of the nation of Israel, like that army's fate rode on that one-on-one -on -one battle. So a lot was riding on the outcome of that battle. And I personally would love it if the Holy Spirit inspired the author to write like a few more paragraphs just to like round things out. <laughs> like, by the way, here's what's going on in Saul's heart and mind, but it's not there. 
But we have to assume something. We have to assume that the Holy Spirit was at work behind the scenes giving Saul that change of heart. And as I thought about it, I thought, you know, King Saul in this moment was a lot like one of the thieves on the cross. When Jesus was crucified, he was between two criminals who were also being crucified. So there were three crosses on the hill that day. And at the start of the crucifixion, both thieves started off mocking Jesus. Here's what it says in the Gospel of Matthew. And the robbers, plural, both of them, who were crucified with Jesus, also reviled him in the same way everyone else was mocking him. So the crucifixion starts. Both criminals have hard hearts toward Jesus. They're mocking him. And then a few hours later, one of the thieves is telling Jesus this in Luke 23. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So this heart change happens, and we know a heart change happened in this one thief because of what that thief said to Jesus. There's not really any details that are given as to what led to that change of heart. I would love to know, again, the inner workings of the heart and mind of that thief, what the Bible doesn't say. We don't know why it happened, we just know that it happened. And, and the same thing happened in our passage today with King Saul's heart toward David. I would love, again, to know why, but those details aren't there. We don't know why it happened. We just know that it happened. And so the Holy Spirit had to be at work behind the scenes, working on Saul's heart to get him to change how he felt about David. And that leads to this key thought. God is always at work, even when you don't see it. God is always at work. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's subtle, but God is always at work. We sing the song Waymaker, a worship song, one of my favorites, that says, even when I don't see it, God, you're moving. Even when I don't feel it, God, you're moving. You never stop. You never stop working. And for some of you, as I was doing my sermon prep, I realized this is why the Holy Spirit drew you to the mission today, for this that key thought. You need to hear that that's, God, that's God's word for you. God is always at work. God is at work in your life right now, even when you don't see it. And right now, if some of you are maybe having this internal battle where you're challenging me with an area of your life that's a struggle, that's, there's a giant attacking you, and that thought just popped in your mind right now, God's at work in that area in your life. He's always at work, even when you don't see it. Verse 38, then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. And so again, what King Saul was doing made all the sense in the world, right, to think about again. Who is David fighting? He's fighting Goliath. And so according to human wisdom, right, anyone who's going to face a warrior as tall as Goliath, as big, he's a man of war with all his body armor and all, all these weapons, they should be equipped with the best armor, shouldn't they? They should have the best, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever weapons. According to the wisdom of the world, they should have the best of the best. And who would have the best of the best? Who would have the best armor in the, armor of Israel, in, in the army of Israel? It would be King Saul. Who would have the sharpest sword, the best sword? The king would. And so going back to the 38th verse, Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. So Saul gives David his own armor. David tries to walk in them, tries to see if he can move in them. And very quickly, like I'm imagining, it's like the moment in the Wizard of Oz where the Tin Man gets oil for the first time. He's like, eat, 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 eat. Right? That's what I can imagine. Even though he has the best armor in the entire army, that armor was not him. He couldn't fight in it. But in this moment, right, David was in a tricky place 
Because who's the one that gave him the armor? The king. And so how can you say no to the king, right? And we all have people pleaser in us. And so even though the armor didn't fit him and he's walking around like a robot, he could have still, with his free will, chose to wear it because he didn't want to offend the king. Or maybe he could have still chose to wear the armor anyway, even though he knew it didn't fit because he's thinking, you know what? I'm just a shepherd boy. These guys are like trained warriors and assassins. Maybe they know something. I don't know. Like, what was I thinking? Not wanting to wear the armor. And like, I, I can imagine there's a lot of battle going on in his mind right, right there. And again, he had free will. If he chose that route, if he chose to fight Goliath, wearing Saul's armor, the line of Jesus would not have gone through David because David's line would have stopped that day in the valley. Just think about it. Instead of the battle being over in a few seconds with David as the champion, the battle would have been over in a few seconds with Goliath holding David's head in his hand. So verse 39 continues. This is a critical moment. I can't go in these. David protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So he took them off again. What's interesting there is it says he took them off again, which it sounds like he put them on, took them off, and maybe he had some second thoughts, and he put them back on, then he took them off again. Just imagine that, right? I can't go in these. So David made the choice not to wear the armor that Saul wanted him to wear. Instead, we know what he did. Verse 40, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd's bag. He then armed only with his staff and sling, his shepherd's staff and sling. He started out across the valley to fight the Philistine. And again, this is now where the sermon title comes in, You Do You, because that's exactly what David did. He was true to himself. He was true to his identity in God. Leif Hetland writes this in his book, Giant Slayers. Our identity is linked to our victory. When we embrace who we are and who God made us to be, we unlock our destiny. When we, like David, become comfortable with being ourselves, we are most ready to defeat the giants in our own way. To win against our giants, we must be comfortable walking in our own unique anointing. To do that, we must spend time daily in God's presence where we are reminded of who we are and what we carry. As we regularly connect with him and we become familiar with the unique tools that he has given us, then when our battle comes, we'll be ready to fight as ourselves. Amen. Come on. So I was recently having a meeting with someone here at the church, and I was asking a series of questions to them. And after we met, I reflected on the questions that I asked, and I really felt the Holy Spirit led me in the questions I asked. It was this cool thing, like the Bible calls it, words of knowledge. The Holy Spirit just kind of fills your mind and fills your mouth, and you, and you start to share words and phrases, and you're like, where did those come from? Those came from the Holy Spirit. And so as I thought about the questions I asked this person, I realized those questions weren't just for them. They were for our entire church family. These are questions that I realized I need to ask myself. And they're questions that I want to ask you. And it's going to be a series of questions. And at first glance, it might sound like I asked the same question five times. They're not redundant. They are nuanced. And I decided in, in, instead of uh, having you scramble to write them all down, in your program... In the questions for uh, Digging Deeper, question number six has these questions. So I just would love for you to, to be fully present and allow these questions to wash over you and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you without having to write down super fast. So here are the questions, Holy Spirit, just I pray you blow fresh wind on these. First question, what quote-unquote armor do my loved ones want me to wear? See, the Bible says God has a plan for your life, and that's true. But what's also true is your loved ones have a plan for your life, too. <laughs> they have a plan for your life where they want you to act a certain way, do certain things, think a certain way. And if you're honest, some of 
their ways, aren't you? There's armor they're trying to put on you, and it doesn't fit. And you know it doesn't fit, but it's very tempting to wear it anyway, to please them, to keep the peace. So what armor, what armor do my loved ones want me to wear? Second question, so important. What armor does the world want me to wear? What values, what beliefs, what emotions like fear and anxiety does the world and those in power who run it, from a human perspective, want you to feel? What armor does the world want you to wear? And they're trying to put it on you. Just again, pray into that question. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to you. Another question. What armor was I wearing that I, that I felt was the right armor, but took it off for someone else other than God. Maybe you're doing something in your life, with your life, and, and you, man, God was at the center of it, but then you stopped to appease someone else. Another question. This is a key question. These last two bubble to the top of the list in my heart for you. What armor do I sense God wanting me to wear? When we embrace who we are, who God made us to be, we unlock our destiny. When we, just like David, become comfortable with being ourselves, then when our giants attack us, and trust me, there's lots of giants in the world, we'll be able to fight them and win. This is important. I felt there's two phrases the Holy Spirit laid on my heart. This is for at least someone, at least one person, probably a lot of you. Two things. Hear me right now. Number one, when God made you, he did not make a mistake. When God made you, he did not make a mistake. Next one. You are not going to be the first failure that God made. You're not going to be the first failure. You're not going to be God's first failure. And if, that's, if either of those questions especially hit you, make sure you get prayer. I love to pray for you. Other members of a prayer team will pray for you, pray over you. Just break that off of you. What armor do you sense God wanting you to wear? When God made you, who did God make you to be? What passion, what skills, what gifts, what abilities? And I, wanna, I have one more question, but I, I want to set it up with a verse that God gave to me back in 2010 when Kelly and I were just taking our first steps to plant this church. Proverbs 29, 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord is kept safe. That's, just, that's been this anchor scripture. I quoted a lot. <laughs> Here's the question based on that scripture. What quote-unquote armor would I wear if I had no fear of man? If you had no fear, no fear of people, if you didn't care what people think, what would you do? What risk would you take because you feel God inviting you to take it? What do you sense God inviting you to do? He made you to join him to advance his kingdom in a particular way. What way is it? Not for your glory, but for God's glory. And for some of you, for some of you, right, it changes in seasons. I just felt this word. If you're a mom, it's for the glory of God, what you're doing. If you're caring for a family member, that's the armor that God wants you to wear right now in this season. Again, maybe that just hit me. But I really love to invite you to press into those questions. Take some time th this week. Go through, I mean, go through all the questions, digging deeper, but it's particularly question six and those questions. Reflect on them, pray into them, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you into all truth. But I believe as I was praying into this sermon in particular, I feel like this is just some things I needed to declare for my family, for our church family, for the American church, for the global church. It is time 
for us to take off the armor the world wants us to wear. It's time for us to take off the armor that we wear because of fear. It's time for us to put on the armor God wants us to wear. It's time for us to take a look at the armor that our loved ones or the world or the devil wants us to wear and puts on us and to say what David said, I can't go in these. I can't go in these. And to take that armor off and by faith pick up our sling and our five smooth stones. And slay those giants. Instead of wearing the armor that we wear because of fear that the world throws on us, that the devil would love for us to wear, it's time that we embrace our identity in Christ, that we live out our identity in Christ. We pick up our stones. We pick up our five smooth stones, and we become the giant slayers God made us to be. Receive that. Receive that. To be continued. Next Sunday. We're going to focus again. If the battle took five seconds, I'm going to preach two sermons about it. Come on. Thank you, Chris. I love it. Love the passion. 